All right. Welcome everyone to our workshop on six ways to transform your coaching practice with Steel Mace Vinyasa. My name is Summer Huntington and I'm the owner here at Flo Shala and also founder of Steel Mace Vinyasa. And it's uh, with great honor that I'm holding this workshop to help you guys better understand this merging of ancient wisdom uh, with modern tools. So um, I believe that we should definitely set, set the bar higher in the movement industry. And uh, a big reason for that is um, we're seeing a lot of injuries happen in various modalities. And I think it's up to us as movement educators to really ensure that people aren't getting injured in the yoga practice. So that was one of the first thing, first reasons that I set out to develop a loaded asana conditioning program back in 2011. Uh, was to prevent injury and to make sure that people that are coming to a yoga class are uh, engaging the muscles properly in the right order, they're creating stability, they're having enough strength to be able to perform the repetitive movements in yoga asana. Um, so I know how it feels to be a yoga instructor and a personal trainer because I've hybridized the two my whole life, uh, so or my whole professional career rather. And uh, I came into this work uh, wanting to bridge the gap between strength training and yoga. And 10 years ago, I had no idea that it would take me uh, to the places that I've brought it. So I've had the fortune of being able to teach seminars globally uh, in Australia, in Europe, in Spain, in Hungary, and all across the US. And we also serve a global community here at the Flo Shala Virtual Studio with our 100 hour Steel Mace Vinyasa teacher training. So uh, if you're wanting to pioneer a new method or you're wanting to carve a niche for yourself, you're in the right place. This is a place that's really supportive of people iterating on the body of work that's been created. And by no means do I own any sort of movement or conditioning drill. This is up for uh, anyone who wants to continue to evolve the practice. And uh, I find, whoop, I find that my uh, job is to really help facilitate just a deeper understanding of the theory and the principles so that we can apply uh, those biomechanics to evolving the practice and to adapting to our, our clients as well and serving their needs. Uh, welcome those that are just coming in. We're just getting started. So uh, I created this workshop both uh, as a way to kind of get people excited about steel mace vinyasa movements. So I'm going to share several movements here. Um, I said that I was going to share three, but I actually have seven that I'm going to demo and kind of show you how those link into asana just to kind of get your feet wet if you're new to steel mace vinyasa. Uh, but I also wanted this to be a platform for folks that are struggling uh, in either personal training or in yoga as a career, and they're wanting to carve a niche for themselves so that they can make their career sustainable. And my goal is to give people tools to transition from just being a technician, which is like a trainer or yoga instructor, just counting reps or going through, you know, sequences that they learned at their yoga teacher training, but not really knowing the nuance of how to educate people on functional movement patterns. So my goal is to help instructors and coaches transition from technician to movement educator and also personal development coach. Like how can we really merge these disciplines, the art and science of flow, uh, and help people better understand their physical vessel so that they can get more out of the practice and that their practice becomes even more meaningful to them. So I definitely know how it feels to be a trainer. Uh, I started full time as a trainer, just managing my own schedule. I've worked uh, as a corporate wellness consultant prior to that. And uh, I was when I was a personal trainer, I was working long, long days. Uh, when I was in New York City as a trainer, I'd work 40 hours a week, but that really turned out to be with all the transport back and forth and, you know, early mornings, big gaps in the middle of the day, long uh, evenings, that those days some, sometimes ended up being 10 to 12 hour days. And I remember going to bed at night, at the end of the night, just still having the, the verbiage in my head of like, engage your glutes, activate your core, or going through the sun salutations because I'd said it so many times to so many different clients in the in the one-on-one -on -one realm. So uh, my goal for you guys is to start thinking about if you're in the career of movement, how can you start to work smarter and not always harder? So how can we start to create systems for our clients to become more autonomous 
apps and do more of the work on their own, which we're seeing a big trend in that in the virtual age with Zoom. And obviously during the pandemic, people are a lot more um, adept to training at home. So how can we help continue to grow their practice so that they understand on a deeper level what's happening, uh, both from a physiological level and the psychology of flow state as well. So the old model of private coaching or uh, even teaching group fitness or group yoga, the old model is uh, the person shows up, we work out with them or we lead them through a yoga sequence. Usually you've got so many clients, you know, stacked that day that you're kind of just making something up on the on the fly. Uh, you might just ask them how they're doing that day and just kind of feel out the session and kind of teach them a randomized workout or a sequence. And there's no real progression to the sequence or to the uh, the cycle. So uh, this also happens a lot in yoga classes. If you've ever gone to a yoga class where the teachers seem to be teaching a full sequence that just didn't quite have any rhyme or reason or a sports specific training purpose and it kind of confused your mind body a little bit or you didn't have full trust in the teacher or maybe you're like is that really supposed to go after that is that a counter pose that really makes sense there or you know I'm not really able to get into flow state I personally actually walked out of a yoga class the other day and I never I tried really hard not to do that but I had to walk out because I wasn't actually in a state of flow and I wanted to recommit to myself that I only want to do movement practices that put me into a state of flow. So the old model of counting reps, randomized workouts, uh, randomized sequences, uh, lacking the, the biomechanics and principles of flow state training applications is on its way out. And the new model of merging movement and mindset and these research-based training methods is on its way in. So. Um, it's definitely challenging to to start something in, especially if nobody's ever heard of a mace. Uh, you're going to come up, come to some, you know, funny looks sometimes if you're introducing the mace. But I encourage you guys to stay strong. And people, you know, they want to get their hands on these tools. They want to be empowered by learning the mechanics of them. And it's a really great time and opportunity to innovate and to share these methods with your community. Uh, and I'll tell you firsthand that 10 years ago when I was doing clubs and yoga, um, I would get some funny stares in the gym. I'd be the only one there doing my crazy neck mobility or, um, you know, doing my loaded asana conditioning. Uh, but I think now people are really, really ready uh, with this becoming more popularized in mainstream movement culture. Um, so I think it's just a really great time to carve a niche for yourself and to raise the bar in the movement industry. So um, I'm going to share several different things. So I want to first talk about the origins of the mace. So I have several different mace and clubs here. So I have a five pound and a seven pound mace. Steel mace vinyasa is generally done with shorter mace. So you'll see the 10 pound mace are about almost a foot longer and they have a slightly thicker handle. Um, the five pound mace on this side has a much skinnier handle and this just kind of varies by the brand this is on it and this is incline so there's a lot of different generic mace companies out there i recommend if you're starting with mace to get a mace that's thicker so that you can have full grip confirmation versus one that's thin like this and the steel mace vinyasa uh, exercises the signature exercises if you will which there are quite a few i'll demo some today uh, they're generally done with the five and the seven for the shorter mace. Uh, however, you can also find 10 pound mace for our, our gentlemen or buffer gals uh, that are sh they're shorter in nature, um, but they are still heavy. And the purpose of having uh, the shorter mace is because we're working a lot of the stabilizing muscles in the shoulder. So specifically the rotator cuff which uh, is comprised of smaller muscles and to wield that mace out you know, either in a modified side flag or a full side flag position uh, requires tremendous amount of stability. And it's not a very large muscle group. Of course, your lats are active, but we just want to make sure that we're not um, putting ourselves at risk for tearing any muscles or straining any muscles. Uh, and then you have your clubs, which are a great stepping stone for learning loaded asana. So this is a five pound club bell. And I developed a system called club bell yoga or kinesiology yoga which uh, is the kind of foundational course for getting um, getting your asana conditioned in a way that's really specific to actual yoga asana, uh, but also just 
opening up range of motion for the everyday person. So you don't have to be a yoga practitioner to do these movements if you want to get more flexible and you want to get more range of motion and uh, decrease your risk of injury. <clears throat> so take a moment to just ask yourself what you're hoping to gain out of this workshop. Like, why'd you show up? I know a few, only a few of us showed up live. Thank you guys for being here. Um, but I'm curious to know what you guys want to take away from this workshop. So feel free to uh, type in the chat bar if you have specific questions. I'll do my best to get to the Q&A later on. Uh, but you can also just set an intention for what you want to take away and what you're going to be absorbing, what's going to land, what you want to land for you most today. So um, I had several different topics that I want to touch on. Um, and I'll go through those systematically. Feel free to take any notes. I'll try to talk slow because I know sometimes I can talk really fast and these concepts are pretty heady. So just uh, if you guys have questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question at any time. And that makes it a little bit more interactive and more fun. Um, so uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of all the, the depth of steel mace vinyasa, I want to encourage you guys, because I know a lot of you guys are, a lot of people that signed up for this workshop, I saw the list were um, trainers and yoga instructors who are just curious how they can add value to their current cli client programs so that they can start increasing their, their earning potential and attracting clients that really value their time, you know, decreasing cancellations and just having more traction with their uh, movement education services. So I wanna share with you guys how to start creating this niche market and designing your signature program to add more value to your services so that you can speak that language and attract clients that are really dedicated to the personal development piece. And it's su such a joy to be able to work with people, your clients, when they're able to speak the language. And we uh, teach people, our everyday clients here at Flow Shallow, we teach them the language that we use as instructors so that they can truly master their own vessel. And that's really what it's all about. So six actions that you can take right away. And they're broken down. There's like many like micro actions to kind of understand um, each one. So the first one is you can add research-based training methods uh, that your clients are gonna love and also talk to their friends about and engage with their community about because they're excited because they're learning new techniques. And here are some ideas for research-based training methodology all of which we teach at Floshala in our teacher trainings uh, and all of them in our higher level coaching curriculum. So the first one is heart rate variability, HRV for short. So heart rate variability is an indicator for how stressed our nervous system is uh, to be able to take on more strain. So if you've ever had one of those days where you're just exhausted and you've got like brain fog and you're just not feeling yourself, uh, or you're feeling like you just don't have any energy, uh, likely your heart rate variability or your recovery is really low. And you can actually track that through biofeedback. So um, we wear just a little watch looking thing. It's a little black strap and it has a light in it. And it, uh, its job is to calculate our heart rate variability by tracking the um, distance between heartbeats in the last phase of our deep REM sleep cycle. So uh, other ways to track HRV are just taking your heart rate right when you wake up, but that's not as accurate because right when you wake up, if there was like an alarm that woke you up, you might go into a higher heart rate. And so we know that it's more accurate to have that little strap on your wrist and tracking it throughout the day so that you can get the most accurate reading and they can uh, take a, um, a calculation of the full five minute range in the last uh, phase of your sleep cycle. So tracking HRV, also uh, one strap that I recommend would be the WHOOP strap. We have that on the Flowshala website. If you go to Flowshala, I think it's under shop and resources, you can find a bunch of information on the WHOOP there. And it also tracks things in your sleep like respiration rate or um, lung volume or latency. Um, it, it tracks and gives you a real easy like red, yellow or green um, little dial that shows you if you're fully recovered, then you're green, you're good to go. Yellow is like kind of moderately recovered and red is like probably should take a rest day on that day. So this really validates uh, another system that we have been using for a long time here at Flowshala and in other methods that I've learned from, uh, particularly circular strength training from my coach, Scott Sonnen uh, in TACFIT. 
So we use a system which is called training on a four day wave or waving your training. And this is a system that's designed to actually optimize your recovery. So what does that mean to train on a wave? That simply means that you are um, building up your intensities day by day to peak at your high intensity. So for example, Monday would be like a no intensity day. So like a brief walk, restorative yoga, something that's putting you into parasympathetic nervous system tone, which is like a relaxed state. Um, then we'd build up to low intensity. So more of your yoga based movement, a little more vigorous, but not like crazy hit stuff. Um, and then building up on the third day to moderate intensity training between 70 and 80 percent of heart rate max, and then peaking at high intensity, 80 to 85 percent of your heart rate max. So if you could remember this, these four things, no, low, mod, high. So feel free to say that in your mind a couple of times. No, low, mod, high, no, low, mod, high. And people always get hung up on, does my wave have to be exactly perfect every single day? No, it's something to shoot for. It's something to start creating structure so that you're not just doing randomized training uh, and you know having too many high intensity days in a row without any recovery. Um, of course, if you really want to adhere to the methodology and really get the most out of your training, you'll train on some semblance of a wave. Um, and another piece of that too is adding complexity and adding volume as you peak on the high intensity day so that you can have the greatest uh, neurological adaptation uh, to the workout. So when we're working with mace, there's a lot of complexity with like swings and drop swings and moving through multiple planes. So it's really imperative that we um, build into that complexity on the fourth day. And we're doing that through various, um, you know, mobility drills and progressions and adding that layer of complexity on the fourth day. Um, so, so far our two research-based training methods that your clients are going to love and tell your friends about or tell their friends about it if they're into geeking out of movement is HRV and training on a four-day wave. Um, and my second action that you can take right away is um, actually using the steel mace to change your posture and empower people consistently. So what I found from running this studio here in Bellingham, Washington, where most of our clients had never ever seen a mace or a club before they stepped in. They're just everyday regular people is that people consistently have changes in posture. They're feeling their lats in different ways. They're picking things up differently. Their back pain goes away and they consistently use the word. I feel empowered. I feel strong. I feel powerful. I feel empowered again and again and again. So after, you know, three years of having this studio and being, you know, being the flagship steel mace and kinesiology yoga studio in the country that fully embraces this method. It's not like we have just one class. It's like our whole schedule is filled with steel mace hit classes and steel mace vinyasa classes and seeing these consistent results of posture shifting for the better people taking it into their everyday life and people saying the word that they feel empowered. I wanted to look a little deeper in the research and see why that was happening so consistently. So um, when you're training your stabilizers, so the mace really targets your uh, deep stabilizers in your shoulders. So your rotator cuff, which we touched on, serratus anterior, of course the lat plays a role as well. Um, your deep core stabilizers, so if you're an anatomy geek like me, uh, your deep core stable stabilizers would be your pelvic floor, your transverse abdominis, your internal and external obliques, your paraspinals, and then your six deep rotators in your hip girdle. So when we start to train all of our stabilizers versus all of our prime movers, which conventional lifting touch does a great job with, you know, pushing, pulling, um, using straps, using bands, using dumbbells will target usually like one area. And it's usually a prime mover. It's usually like your quads or your hamstrings or your biceps or your triceps. Uh, but working with the steel mace and integrating it into asana transitions really targets a whole different, uh, level of internal stability. And so as you start to train your internal stabilizers, i.e. the shoulders, the deep inner core, the glutes, we call it the trifecta, things are going to shift in your posture because you're building more endurance in those stabilizers that don't often uh, get activated 
and one of the key ways that we activate the stabilizers with steel mace vinyasa is by cueing uh, to generate torque. So hopefully you guys are hanging with me. I know we're going deep into some theory here, but I really want to add a lot of value and get you guys thinking about how can I start creating a niche for myself. And I invite anyone that's curious about studying to either take classes at Floshala or hang out to the end of this video and I'll share a cool opportunity for anyone that's curious uh, to get involved. Uh -huh. So we know now why steel mace starts to uh, change people's posture and then the empowerment piece. All right, this is gonna get really nerdy here. So uh, the steel mace is modeled after an ancient tool called the gada, which is found throughout Persia and India and various cultures to train warriors for battle. So it's actually a weapon that can really hurt someone. Something like a uppercut lunge, for example. Hmm. This would be a movement that you could actually use a bigger mace to break through a door. You can crack someone's skull with this thing. It's very, it's actually a really violent tool. Uh, of course, we've harnessed the power of it. And if you look um, back in ancient texts, like Hindu texts, you'll see different Hindu deities uh, wielding a mace. And so there's actually a lot of historical um, relevance to the steel mace, to the gada. And because it was used to train warriors for battle, um, when we're using this tool, it's actually conjuring up this um, inner knowledge or ancient knowledge of how to actually protect yourself. So how to be competent with a, a tool that our ancestors used potentially for protection or for you know different tools for chopping wood to create heat and warmth um, or uh, using it uh, to train for battle, to actually get the body conditioned enough to be able to protect, you know, if you have a have a, another tribe that's coming in to attack, for example. So um, another layer of that is when you're using the mace and you're doing these kind of fighting like motions and you're wielding it with such control, um, it really allows your nervous system to understand what it's what it feels like to complete the fight or flight uh, cycle. So when we are faced with uh, either trauma or stress, or we're in a situation where we need to um, actually like fight or flee the situation, let's say we're being attacked in an alley, for example, that would be a, an example of trauma. So if I am being attacked in an alley and I, uh, I run, then my body has an opportunity to actually finish that cycle. But what if I'm attacked in the, in the alley and I don't actually get to run or fight and I actually fully get attacked, that's a traumatic experience that then is housed in my nervous system. So by wielding the mace and being able to uh, create competence in these movement patterns, it allows us to get out of the oscillation uh, cycle. So cortisol, adrenaline, um, the kind of like ghost memory of the traumatic experience can actually be um, moved through the body by wielding these different tools. So trauma can show up in more subtle ways as well. It can show up um, in emotional trauma. For example, if somebody is uh, not allowing you to speak your truth or you're having some poor boundaries or whatnot, uh, training with the mace can start to open up your fascial lines in such a way that you're able to uh, unlock bound energy and start to embody the posture of a warrior as well. So a good resource if you're curious more about releasing trauma, uh, check out any of Peter Levine's work. He's one of the lead researchers, researchers for trauma, and we've integrated a lot of his um, teachings into our 100-hour steel mace vinyasa curriculum as well. All right. So back to the basic stuff, <laughs> we went on a little tangent there, so I tend to do. Uh, this is my jam. I love talking about steel mace and flow state. Um, so um, another reason why our um, steel mace vinyasa practice is so powerful and why it changes posture is because it's really working on the functional movement patterns that we see in functional movement screens. So uh, Dr. Gray Cook developed a real simple functional movement screen, which we teach in our one of our prerequisite courses for our steel mace vinyasa teacher training. And um, all of the, mov the movements and the conditioning exercises that we do with the steel mace are targeted towards improving those uh, functional movement patterns. 
So things like the overhead squat, the inline lunge, the lying hamstring raise. Um, I'm just kind of spitting off the, the movement screens. If you're curious about Gray Cook's work, feel free to check it out. It's G-R-E-Y and then Cook with an E. And just look up the FMS. So um, the functional movement screen is a really great way to add value to your services and then to give people actual measurements where they can test themselves initially and then they can retest themselves later on and they can see um, how their body has actually improved and how their movement patterns have improved. And we do this through a very signature sequence. Uh, we call it prime condition and flow. So anyone that's still Mace Vinyasa certified or has learned the modality, uh, they know that every, every class that's a HIT class has three elements. The first element is priming. So priming the neural pathways for the, mo and for the movements that are coming ahead in the, in the conditioning phase. Then we move into conditioning, which is uh, a learning round and two timed rounds moving from simple to complex so that we elicit that flow state response. And then we tie it up together with the last phase of class, which is either uh, loaded flow and unloaded flow or some, some variation of flow-based movement. And then of course our decompensation. So if you follow that recipe and you know that you're moving away from the randomized training and sporadic training and training with a purpose and training progressively, you can really get some amazing results and you can get people into a flow state uh, ideally, the more you practice, the longer you can get into a state of flow in your training sessions. And we know that being in a state of flow is one of the most healing places for the human mind to make long-term sustainable behavioral change. So basically you're teaching people to be intrinsically rewarded by their practice so that they just feel better when they come to practice. They've got their adrenaline, you know, metabolized, like it doesn't have to hang out in their bloodstream. Their cortisol is being metabolized and they are increasing serotonin and dopamine as well. Um, the feel good chemicals. So um, one other kind of concept you might consider about why this practice is so darn effective, uh, loaded asana conditioning has the power to activate more motor units than um, a traditional weight because of, and especially if it's cued properly, it's because of the torque, uh, both coming from the ground. So torque is defined as external rotation in a ball and socket joint. And when we have torque coming from the ground up, so our ball and socket joint of our femur, as well as our ball and socket joint of our um, shoulder girdle wielding the mace, uh, we start to recruit maximum motor units uh, in all of our myofascial meridian line. So not just like one muscle, but the whole entire fascial line gets recruited along with our stabilizers, deep stabilizers in the shoulder, the core and the hips. And the nerdy concept, if you're curious, is called post-activation potentiation, PAP for short. And so that's the mechanism behind why when we take the load away, and I'm really excited to actually get in some movement demos here soon. Um, and we take the load away, we're left with greater power a better understanding of our alignment, greater enhanced proprioception, better balance, um, better tracking, and uh, that feeling of being able to track with our eyes and then be able to take, uh, not have to look behind us to know where things are because we're able to actually track things in space better. So if you're wanting to check out some scholarly research, check out post-activation potentiation. And we discovered that later on after we'd already been teaching seminars, you know, for several years, I started getting curious about why is it that consistently again and again, my athletes are mastering these yoga asana without coming from a yoga background. And it's because of post-activation potentiation. When you train with a purpose and you train movement patterns under load with maximum torque, um, you're going to get an amazing result, which is better posture, more of a feeling of empowerment. Um, so let's get into the three steel mace movements that seniors love and feel safe doing. And the reason I chose seniors for these first three are because a lot of our clients at Floshala are definitely in the aging population because they want to improve their balance. They're the ones that are most commonly, you know, hiring private instructors because uh, they're really invested in their wellness and they want to age gracefully. So uh, the first one is slow grinds from kneeling. So I'll get my little box out of the way here. So um, let's 
make sure you guys can see me. I think you can see me pretty well. I'm going to tip this camera down just a hair. Boom. Cool. The joys of running a virtual studio. That last little bit we want to see. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to work with that. <laughs> so slow grinds from kneeling. <clears throat> So just a quick little lesson on generating torque. So this is a this is a kneeling lunge. I'm not toe tucked under. I'm actually pressing top of the foot all the way down to recruit the entire front line. Pelvis is in a neutral position. You can do a little torque check by placing the fist on the inside and the outside of the knee, generating torque, having midfoot balance, squeezing the back glute on and making sure that the body is upright. So I'm not tilted here. My pelvis isn't out of alignment. It's just sitting perfectly upright like a bull. So slow grinds, great for building uh, core awareness and postural awareness. You can start with your mace in what's called order position with neutral grip and definitely choke up on the mid grip here. Take your two um, helper fingers here and take your shoulder, lift it up, draw it down and back and place it in a seated neutral position and then start to put pressure down on the globe of the mace, lengthen through the crown head, keep everything on the glutes and the core active and engaged. And with your two helper fingers here, you can start to angle your mace to generate a little bit of leverage and then lift the bent arm, the 90 degree arm up and over the shoulder. Avoid elbow flaring out like this. Just keep it in line and tracking and then pull the mace back to an order position and then connect your lat, your deep inner core and your glutes. So from the side, it looks like this. I inhale as the mace goes over into back position. I wield the mace with a little bit of leverage coming out of it and exhale power breath. Inhale, mace comes over, helper hand, exhale. From the front, making sure that the mace is tracking right in line with the shoulder here. And then elbow marries against the rib to engage the obliques and core. Great for developing core strength and working on postural uh, alignment and building confidence. We want to start with really simple movements that are not overly complex or moving through too many degrees of freedom, but just really building that stamina in the shoulder girdle and letting the uh, core become aligned so that everything is active in that final pull down phase of the shoulder girdle, the deep inner core and the glutes. Um, second exercise, warrior two switches, modified. All right, so this one is a great conditioning drill for warrior, anything that's an open hip asana. So we've got our warrior two, Lunge. This is a modified side five position. Mace comes to center, pack the shoulders, lift the toe, pivot the toes to the outside. And notice I'm keeping the mace close to me and I'm keeping the arms at 90 degrees to ensure that my humerus, my arm bone is pivoting and doing external rotation in its socket to a degree that feels comfortable at first. And then over time, the mace might come behind the head, inhaling back position, exhale modified side flag. And we'll just stick with level one and level two since we're working with seniors. And since I don't have my workout clothes on today, I don't want to get too sweaty in our workshop. We got a lot, a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, big wheel from mountain pose number three. So this one targets our obliques. So it's really great for helping people increase like lat range of motion and side bending. So things like standing half moon pose, which I'll demo in a moment. So here's my reverse guard position. You'll notice again, the arm is 90 degrees. Super common misalignment is people not knowing how to do 90. So they'll hold the mace like this, which is activating a lot of their bicep to hold the load. We wanna lift the shoulder and seat it in its neutral position, have the top hand facing out, rip and crush, squeeze the glutes on, keep everything nice and taut in the lower half, and then cartwheel the mace uh, over, feeling a stretch in the side body, and then return the mace back to the starting position. Again, cartwheel, power breath, and recoil. One more, cartwheel, and recoil. So this can also be done in a warrior two asana, which you'll recognize this um, movement pattern happens a lot in asana. As you finish your flow, you cartwheel the hands down. So here we're kind of training that uh, lateral bending motion or that transition in asana. Um, so those are the three mace movements I love to get my, my senior clients um, confident in so that they can start 
moving under load and it just helps with their proprioception, helps with their balance and helps them feel just really good in their bodies. Like they're accomplishing something and they're training with a purpose. Um, three more exercises that I added on, which are a little more advanced. One is for balance. And these definitely can be modified for seniors as well. Um, and the other ones can be adapted to every age. So um, just wanted to give you guys a couple bonus ones. We've got our warrior three LDL. So you start with or RDL. So you start with the base leg um, stacked, hip, uh, knee, and toe. Take the tiptoe back, find a hip hinge. So uh, keeping the spine segmentally stabilized. So you tilt your pelvis back with control, lengthen through the crown of head, drive up, squeeze the glutes at the top, lengthen through the crown of head. Again, hinge, deep hip hinge, and exhale as you come up. And eventually over time, you can start to keep uh, lift, you can lift your back leg with your trunk, keeping your hips squared. You can either tap the toe against the ground or pull the leg all the way up, keeping the shoulders packed and engaged. That translates into yoga asana with helping uh, develop the proprioception needed to be in a sandal, standing single leg balance pose, such as warrior three. Uh, warrior two to skandasana demo a modified variation of that. So this is one of our more complex drills. We've got our warrior two, shift the weight into the back leg, press the mace out to two-handed flag, come back to skandasana and find external rotation here. This one's great for just creating uh, adductor length. So increasing the, uh, the length of the, um, the muscle belly as well as the tendons and ligaments to help you get a more adductor range of motion, more power. And then the last one is twisted runner's lunge. So I'll demo modified version here with the, with the club bell. So you can keep the knee on the ground, twisting up, finding thoracic rotation here, or curl the back toe under, lift the back knee and bring the mace or the club up. And um, does anyone have any questions so far? I'll check the chat bar. I think most of us are just tuning in and listening. All right. So I got my little workout in for the day, actually trained this morning and I recently had um, had a baby. So I'm working on a lot of deep core stability. All of my exercises I'm doing are all level one because uh, I literally just gave birth like seven weeks ago. So I'm using the same building blocks that I would for anybody that has been deconditioned or is coming back from a big surgery or major life event. I'm just starting with level one of you know, working the static postures, not a lot of complexity, not a lot of load, but it feels so good on the body. And I just feel so grateful to be able to train with other moms that are kind of going through the same thing as well. Um, so my next topic here, so why you should start using flow fit for a movement screen. Um, so if you're not familiar with FlowFit, definitely do a, a YouTube search of it and you can search my name, FlowFit Summer Huntington. Uh, I've taught some seminars on FlowFit and FlowFit was developed by my coach, Scott Sonnen, as the modern rendition of the Tibetan rites. So if you've ever heard of the Tibetan rites or even just sun salutations, they're designed to put you in a state of flow, a flow without a thought. So you uh, basically get into the sequence of the seven exercises, the flat foot squat, the quad press, the sit through hip, mountain climber to spinal twist, uh, tripod, up dog, down dog, and spinal rock. Those are the key movements in the flow fit sequence. And as you start to do them one after another, there's a flat foot squat in between every single one. And so you're always returning to the most functional movement pattern that there is, which is the functional flat footed squat. Um, and you're starting to build uh, your rhythm with your breath. So you're really syncing every single movement with either an inhale or an exhale. So why should you start using FlowFit as a movement screen? Well, the first movement screen I described, which is designed by Dr. Uh, Gray Cook, is really great for just looking at um, simple movement patterns, like very, very simple. But the FlowFit, uh, as you start getting familiar with FlowFit and you train it in your own body, really looks at how do we move and transition from the flat footed squat to bearing load on the hands? How do we, uh, we're looking at like rotation or yaw. Uh, we're looking at some pretty complex uh, movement patterns. So it's just like a nice way to kind of deepen your own practice. And we actually give it to a lot of our clients as homework. So people uh, can integrate FlowFit in their practice 
by just setting a timer and doing as many rounds of flow fit uh, as they can in 20 minutes and then starting to build that up. Uh, I have my teachers in training submit a round of flow fit uh, via video so I can analyze power leakages and see like where they're not having their lats turned on or where they're, um, you know, kind of cheating or leaking power in some areas through poise analysis. Um, so if you're wanting to evolve your practice beyond just looking at isolated areas, the functional movement screen is a great place to start. But as you start um, progressing and understanding movement quality a little bit more, you can start to integrate flow foot as a secondary movement screen as your clients get more proficient with those movement patterns. Um, so some ways that you can integrate flow fit into your own practice too is by doing the uh, exercises in pyramid sets. So a pyramid set would be like doing uh, 10 flat foot squats followed by 10 quad press followed by 10 sit through hip. And I'm speaking of those in order because that's the order that they go in. Um, 10 of the next ex exercise, the mountain climber to spinal twist. 10 tripods, 10 up dog, down dog, 10 spinal rock. You might start with six. 10 is definitely going to be a long class, a long workout. So you'd go 10 of everything, then eight of everything, then six of everything, four of everything, two of everything, and you peak at one so that you're starting to really build that endurance and you get time to repeat the exercise again and again to really refine form. So there's a lot of nuance in flow fit uh, training. Like everything is fully active, lots of torque. Um, getting that trifecta powered up, syncing the movement with breath. There's a lot of intention behind the, mo the movement and coaching it. So um, you can really get help get your clients in a state of flow and just building their confidence in functional movement patterns. So you got pyramid sets. You can, like I said, set a timer for 20 minutes, see how many rounds you can get. Um, and then you can really break apart each functional movement pattern in flow fit uh, and address each area too with our open and closed chain mobility drills too. Um, next topic, how to use the three P's concept to shift emotional patterns within the practice uh, and decide upon the three, oh, sorry, <laughs> let's break down the three P's before we decide upon the most common ones that we see. So the three P's are something that I have integrated into our steel mace vinyasa teacher training. And it's real simple. It's just uh, patterns, posture, power leakages. Most people are just looking at movement through the lens of posture and then power leakages. So we can start there just to give you a little framework. So when we're looking at posture, postural deviations, so some common ones, um, if I was to stand sideways here, we've got the pelvic tuck, we've got the hips shifted forward here. Um, we've got our shoulders rounded forward. Um, if you have an injury on right or left sides, you might be like bearing load on one side. So learning how to, uh, to look at somebody's standing resting, resting posture and identify where their postural deviations is a, are is a really great starting point. So if I'm looking at a human and I see from straight on, straight ahead, I'm looking to see, are the knees stacked over the toes? Or are they caving in? Um, are the shoulders dipped? Is one shoulder higher than the other? Are the hips dipped up or down? Where does the jaw line up here? Are the arches collapsing in, or am I bearing load evenly on the outer parts of the, the feet? So those are all things that you can document and make notes to yourself with a quick um, postural analysis. From the side, you can see where does the hip um, land relative to the heels. So we're looking to see that the, uh, the ankle bones, the knees, the hips, the shoulders, and the ears are all stacked. And for every inch that the ear is forward uh, from the shoulder. That's an extra 10 pounds, roughly, of extra load on the cervical vertebra. So uh, really just getting the person back to a neutral stance is going to be really powerful for taking away any aches and pains in the neck and then the low back as well. So um, from the side, we're looking at the alignment uh, from the ankle bones all the way up to the ear. And then uh, from the top down, we're looking at like rotation. So rotation of the feet, does the person when they're standing in neutral stand like this or sometimes a little bit less often, but you've got your people that walk around with the internal rotation. Um, and then sometimes if you can look from up above, you can see slight rotation. Um, and this shows up too when the person is shirtless, if they take off their shirt and they see like lines in their 
folds in their back or in their um, their torso, you can see where things are kind of shifted and kind of um, drawing in, like where's the fascia wadded up and, and pulling towards. So um, the three Ps, you've got your posture, which I just went through how to identify uh, postural deviations from neutral. And again, everything we do in somis vinyasa is designed to get you back to neutral with less effort because we want those stabilizers to fire uh, without us thinking about them. So posture, if we have postural deviations or, you know, tight fascia, or that's what causes the postural deviations generally is bound up or wadded fascia. So if I have, you know, rounded forward shoulders, I'm tight on my front line, which might lead to power leakages, the third P in my rotator cuff or in my shoulder girdle. If I have a uh, overly chronically tight hip flexor, that's going to uh, lead to a power leakage on the posterior chain. So any type of kick, kicking back or hip extension is going to be limited because of the uh, frontline fascia being a little bit tighter or more bound. Um, so the, the three Ps, you've got your emotional pattern, which we haven't talked about yet. We've got posture and we've got our power leakages. So generally the posture and the power leakages, it's real easy for us to see, or maybe it's new to us, but it's, it's more um, common knowledge to be able to, to tie those two together. Like if I have a postural deviation, it's probably gonna result in some power leakages and I can identify that. The first P is the one that's a little bit more nuanced. So the first P is, is stands for patterns or emotional patterns. So how we think, and how we feel in our soma or our body mind absolutely impacts how our body shows up in the world and how our posture might shift. I'll give you an example. So let's say you have been in an unhealthy relationship for a long time where you're, um, every time you have an argument with this person that maybe is your spouse or maybe is, is just an unhealthy relationship with a family member, um, Every time they say something that's really painful or you have a fight or you have some boundaries that are crossed, there's a small micro retraction that happens in this space. So it can be throat, it can be heart. And the cumulative effect of having the micro contraction over time for, you know, this could be like five to 10 to 20 years sometimes, um, those micro retractions then lead to tightened fascia, which then are the postural deviations that cause the power leakages. Um, other examples of emotional patterns are um, things like being always wanting to have control of everything. So always like being in a state of um, like hyper alertness or sympathetic nervous system tone, fear of trust or lack of lack of trusting people, fear of uh, people, um, you know, crossing boundaries. So we'll just call that the trust, like not trusting other people um, that can show up in um, the eyes kind of being darting around uh, or lacking balance. So not being able to have good balance in the body because you're just always in this like, kind of like fluttering sort of state of not of, of sympathetic arousal. So you'll see a lot of folks uh, really, really struggling with balance as a result of being in that state of constant control. So doing the balance practice can be really grounding and can help um, people let go of the emotional patterns that are not serving them. So this bit is a bit more nuanced. I recommend uh, a book called Body Mind, which uh, is about, it's actually written uh, from testaments about rolfing. So Ida Rolf's work and uh, Feldenkrais and uh, several other practitioners that are more in the body work realm where they did thousands of hours of body work on uh, several different, you know, thousands of humans. And they saw similar patterns that came up when the fascia was released in certain areas. So, you know, heart energetic center always kind of correlated with a sense of like trust or, um, you know, the shoulders always had, are always correlated with bearing a lot of load or having a lot of like burden sort of things. So as we start to think about our emotional patterns and what we want to shift in our own lives, in our own lives, um, the steel mace vinyasa practice can be absolutely be a modality for us to start releasing patterns that no longer serve us. 
So um, a lot of folks that come into my teacher training, they tend to be really high performers, uh, perfectionists, or just really high achievers that are just used to doing and going and momentum. So that for me was a pattern that I set out to release uh, when I started doing somatic therapy and learning about my soma, my body mind. So I realized that my body was just in this state of momentum all the time. I'm just always addicted to going and being in the state of perpetual motion. And so that's a big reason why I'm really stoked. I'm teaching on Sunday nights, restorative and rad roller yoga here at the flow shala, um, and doing more things that allow me to just be instead of being a human doing, I'm just working on being a human being. So um, think about a emotional pattern that you want to shift in your own practice and how you can start to uh, reverse engineer uh, your body into uh, releasing the pattern that doesn't serve you. So really the first step is just tuning in and seeing how it feels somatically. What are the sensations associated with that pattern that you want to release? And how can you go to your mat with the uh, intention of putting space around that sensation, allowing yourself to move through it, and then re um, hardwiring your nervous system to have a new sensation. Hmm. Uh, my final uh, tip for you guys to get started right away on adding more value to your services and to your practice is to ditch randomized work workouts and write progressive steel mace vinyasa movement programs. So um, randomized workouts are the old model. We're moving towards a new model and a new paradigm where people really want more than just a workout. They want a mind-body practice. And that's where we come in with having all this knowledge of you know, research-based training methods, training on a four-day wave, training progressively, moving from simple to complex, understanding the body and understanding how things work to improve our functional movement patterns. And then also the three Ps. So it's a lot. It's definitely a deep dive. Um, but it's so gratifying to be able to truly master your own vessel so that you can share this with your community as well. Um, so uh, the final closing for this workshop, um, I'd love to invite anyone that's hung out towards the end. If you're curious about learning more about these modalities, um, I'm going to be hosting a small cohort, which is like a bite-sized version of my 100-hour teacher training. So uh, I believe the cumulative continuing ed credits range between 30 and 40 uh, continuing ed credits, depending on how many movement labs you attend um, versus the 100 hour. So if you're wanting to get started with really mastering uh, these techniques, I encourage you to get in. I'm starting it the first week of November and I'm interviewing people between now and when it's filled. So if you are curious about it and you want to chat with me, um, I'm going to put my link to schedule directly here in the chat bar. And there's a possibility I might share this on YouTube later on too, just to recruit folks. Um, the, pro the program is called Embodying Flow. And this is a, a deep dive in learning uh, movement coaching 101 and um, learning kinesiology yoga and prime. And uh, I'm going to be just fast tracking people to get it done. So if that's something that interests you and you want to take advantage of being a part of that cohort, uh, I encourage you to set up a time to chat with me and um, we can go into the details of the program. Uh, and I do ask that anybody that does the program, since it is a beta test, you're definitely going to get a screaming deal on it. Um, but I encourage you to um, to leave a testimonial and that'll be one of the things that's a benefit of, of doing this is that you'll be able to um, provide a video testimonial and a written testimonial of how it has impacted your movement practice. So thank you guys all for showing up for this workshop. I hope you got a lot of value and I hope you're excited to take it to the next level. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can again, schedule a chat with me um, or reach out to our team. Thanks all everyone for being here and for tuning in. And I will uh, share this recording out with the folks that weren't able to make it live. Namaste. Thanks, everyone. And I will stop the video. Oops, stop the recording here.